Hi, I'd like to introduce you to a world-renowned coach, Chance Tarot. And he is here today in order to talk about his work with the shadow from a Jungian perspective and also how he works with his clients when he sees them self-sabotaging and uh, getting in their way. So please join us uh, in the therapist hour with Chance. Thank you. My, my talk here and my presentation is gonna be about shadow, uh, which is one of um, Carl Jung's fantastic contributions to the world and um, to psychology. And um, I've been studying uh, Jungian shadow work, archetype work for almost for about 17 or 18 years. So about 20 years in the coaching world and the workshop world um, all over the world and seeing how it transfers and um, it, it works uh, basically everywhere. <clears throat> The shadow being many, having many, many different um, definitions, but basically being the unconscious belief we have about ourselves that dictates behavior and choices that we pick up in, in childhood and, um, and then go, becomes unconscious. Um, so we all have needs as children and um, we go about getting those needs met in really creative and resourceful ways um when we don't seem to be getting them met and the you know adaptations that occur is that we start to act in peculiar ways and those peculiar ways work pretty good when you're six or seven or you're eight years old or 10 years old or what have you but somewhere is around 12 or something like that um we don't recognize that we're doing them we're not doing them on purpose and then we actually don't even know that we're doing them anymore this is, these are my opinions and, and theories. Um, so uh, they still kind of work. And, um, but, but what happens is that underneath of that, something important that has to also be present is we don't, we don't think we deserve, deserve to have our needs met. And so um, we think that we have to do something special or um, perform in some particular way in order to get our needs met. And we carry that on throughout the rest of our lives. Um, so I'm looking at some notes here and coordinating as we, as we look at this. Um, so the other thing that, that I believe occurs is that we look to substantiate that we don't believe our, our needs are, are um, going to get met. So we, the world tells us that we're unworthy of getting our needs met. And we also then begin to believe it. So we project that out. And the funny thing is that kind of goes both ways to substantiate that and, and have us believe uh, throughout the rest of our lives that um, we're unworthy or we're unlovable or we are all these other different kinds of things. So sabotage occurs because of this. Um, if we don't think we're worthy, and then if something does show up or someone does love us, then we tend to sabotage that and make sure that we shut it down or break that type of um, uh, channel of energy that's being sh shared with us. The thing that um, I think is most notable where um, our, our shadow shows up is, um, is in our agreements. We tell people we will do things or they ask us to do things. And um, unconsciously, we have a way of breaking agreements so that we push people away from us. And um, I have a saying where when we keep our agreements, we bring love towards us. And when we break our agreements, we push love away. Uh, love being on the spectrum of connection and um, just very far over there. I, I think from personal experience and from what I've noticed, um, when our shadow is running the show, I'm actually afraid of being loved. I'm afraid of being seen. I'm afraid of being found out. And so I keep people away and I break agreements or I don't do the things I say I'm going to do so that I just kind of keep people away. Um, and I think that this is really, really common. So um, when I said that it's an unconscious negative belief I ha we have about ourselves that we pick up in childhood, um, it is something that we truly do believe. I, I, I think that 
most of us um, truly do believe when a certain part of us is is the one who's uh, behind the, the the wheel that I I believe that I am not lovable and uh, I believe that I am not worthy and um, so these are our beliefs that are ingrained in us we almost have a of an attachment to us so when people come along and um, think to the contrary, um, we think there's something wrong with them. When our shadow is running the show, we um, call it fate. And it's actually just us, you know, screwing our own lives up. <clears throat> Here we go. So um, everything that we do um, has an effect on our life. And um, Understanding our shadow and our subconscious uh, helps us understand why we make the choices we make, why we have the unconscious biases that we have and the tendencies to end up in some particular kind of relationship um, or why we um, show up late to things and uh, maybe we need attention or um, that's a way that we've adapted to um, trying to to get something get some need met so um i i think that uh there's many different arguments or, or conversations we can have about what our needs are but uh we need love and we need to belong um we need certainty and we also need novelty we need uncertainty we need surprises and things like that <clears throat> um we also need connections, which love is, is there. We also need to be significant. I need to be special. I need to, that's why when, you know, we're in a intimate relationship, that's our significant other, because hopefully we are significant to them. Um, we also need to grow, you know, evolution, adaptation, and um, growth is important to us as humans, uh, as well as contribution. We all want to feel like we're giving something to the world. So um, when we've experienced trauma or struggles or some kind of pain, not getting what we think we deserve in terms of getting our needs met, it tends to skew all of these things. And what I notice is um, we need more certainty than we, a, a person who's um, you know, well adapted. So our need for certainty goes up and our need for uncertainty goes down. I don't want surprises anymore. So, um, and, and certainty can come in the form of control. It can come in the form of manipulation and all kinds of things like that. Um, the other thing is then in, in terms of connection and, and, and love, we tend to kind of push that away, uh, which creates problems. And, and us getting our needs met later because we want it and yet we're afraid to have it. I, I see this too often um, in people who um, feel insignificant is they do all kinds of things to be significant and then that ends up hurting their relationships because um, significance, uh, the need for significance, you know, heightened more and more and more tends to be pretty narcissistic. And uh, I'm not sure about you, but uh, it gets to be pretty hard to like and be connected to with narcissistic people. So I see these dysfunctions continue to kind of um, unfold in that way. And um, those kind of lower base needs, if they're not relatively sorted out, makes it pretty hard to grow um, because if I'm narcissistic, uh, I don't think I have any problems. I'm not looking to grow. I'm not seeking other people's opinions and outside perspective. I don't really listen to feedback very well. So it makes it hard to grow. And without those things happening, um, it's also hard to contribute something to the world. So um, this is some of the stuff that I continue to notice. And um, we um, end up in relationships that don't work, because, but we stay there because it's familiar. You know, I'm familiar. I'm, I, I didn't get this need met when I was a kid, when I was a child. And um, that was the reality that was formed for me. 
So when I'm in a, an adult or when I'm a young adult or what have you, depending on how ingrained this is, then it continues to just play itself out. Again, um, staying in bed with the devil we know, so to speak. And um, if it feels uncomfortable to be loved, we are creatures of comfort and uh, familiarity. So again, it tends to kind of just be this self-sustaining loop and where we're in, whether it's uh, intimate relationship, business relationship, what have you, where um, if it goes well, uh, it'll feel unfamiliar and we will sabotage it and see what we can to not show up or not do what we say we're gonna do or create some kind of an issue um, and uh, all these different needs or their maladapted um, pronunciation or precipitation of them continues to kind of just play themselves out in unhealthy ways. There's ways to kind of, I believe, sneak up and understand what our um, shadow is and what our unconscious biases are. And the, one of the ways is to begin to really look closely about how we impact those around us. Um, and what we tend to do, what I notice is that um, if I don't feel like I'm very important, I tend to make other people feel like they're not a very important. I project that out onto them. That's kind of part of the way unconscious projections um, work. So um, I may behave in such a way or make choices in such a way. I tell people I'm gonna do something and then I don't do it because I don't think I'm important and it won't really matter. But and then in turn, if I don't do what I say I'm gonna do, it makes them feel unimportant and like they don't matter. So that's another way where um, our behaviors and our, ch our choices continue to substantiate and continue this same way um, of being and living. What I believe occurs as children is that our mapping system is established and um, our experiences um, shape our preferences and um, kind of cultivate our view of the world. And um, so our mapping system uh, is what also then dictates our values, what's important to us. So um, if I have a dangerous and uh, tra traumatic, violent childhood, then um, my mapping system would have me value safety. And so my view of the world is that the world is unsafe and that uh, I'm pretty much constantly looking for threats. And um, if this is our view of the world, uh, I'm not really looking for love and connection and pleasure. I'm looking to basically just see how I can be safe. Um, so the unconscious has a way of always getting what it wants. And the conscious mind only sometimes gets what it wants. And uh, so if our, our life is continuing to create this thing that we have a lot of confusion about why we're creating it, it's because our subconscious is creating it. And our it is, you know, pulling strings and putting things in motion so that that's the life that we have, a, you know, maybe more contained, um, tighter, um, <laughs> less fun, and less pleasurable life. Um, so let me go back a little bit and talk about um, the discomfort part. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll also tie back in here um, if we look at our impact of people and we tell ourselves the truth and face the truth about how we impact people, especially people that we care about and that we love, and we take some really good feedback that what we're doing and how we're behaving isn't working, then um, we're going to have to lean into some discomfort so that um, we can shift those behaviors. <clears throat> And um, that'll feel really, really risky, uh, doing things different than the way that we've always done them. And uh, change is hard and change is risky. Um, 
the thing about our shadow and our bad habits is that they they happen without trying. They're, that's pretty easy. And um, good habits are, require a lot of effort. They require um, you know almost an obsession with continuing to build laps to recreate and kind of retrain that mapping system. Uh, we think uh, I think neuroscientists have identified we we think between eighty and one hundred fifty thousand thoughts per day, and um, if the unconscious is running the the dominant amount of those thoughts, then we've got a pretty steep uphill battle to retrain and to create new habits and and lean into that painful discomfort, whether it be terrifying or whether it be just kind of a little bit uncomfortable. Um, you know, we've got some work to do. And um, I think that routine and patterns is a really, really good way to uh, bring our shadow to the surface and help us see where I have an intention to create something or to do something. And time and time and time again, I can't seem to manage this thing that I know is good for me and that would be good for my life and good for my relationships. Um, and so usually what's, what we need to do is look at the context clues to see what's coming up and why is it coming up and what's underneath of it. And, um, to know that I think at some point, even if we just, um, go on the hunt and, and assume maybe I don't have a certainty around what occurred for me as a kid, um, that I go as if. And then just try to sort out like, okay, um, so I don't remember if my mom loved me or did not love me, um, but I'm going to assume that I've got some issues around that and that's going to play itself out in these different ways. And then I'm going to seek to kind of heal that. Can you say how you work with some of these things like in that framework? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I work with, I work with mostly individuals, mostly entrepreneurs. I do work with small, some small teams. Um, so, you know, I wish I could tell you that people come to me and their life is going amazing and, um, that they want to just like make it a little bit better, which it does happen on uh, occasion. But unfortunately what happens is people come to me and their, their life is in some kind of disaster. And what I notice is that, um, in our thirties, is that uh, we compromise our health, excuse me, we compromise our relationships. And then in our 40s or 50s, we begin to compromise our health. So um, I think that one of the main uh, outcomes uh, of, of having some type of a shadow that is, is running amok is that we're performing. We perform, we perform, we go, 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 go. I work with a lot of high performers um, hundred to a billion dollar a year companies. And, um, I would say 60 to 70% men, but women as well, um, attorneys and, and, and people like that, that are, you know, just go and go and go and want to perform, to try to impress, to get love. And when I was talking about risk, um, it is, so what happens if I don't perform anymore? Will I, you know, because if we're convinced and well, like I said, it's a belief if, if I've convinced myself and I truly believe that the only way to be loved is to perform, to earn or to get the accolades or something like that, then um, I have to kind of create that gap where I don't perform or I perform in a different way or I perform for a different reason. The intention has changed. So um and usually what I try to do is I begin to reset um, the imbalance or begin to sh create harmony. We live in a busy world and um, I'm busy and I'm, you know, I have a lot going, but I think that um, if we're not spending time with the people that we love and, or we, we we're convinced ourselves that this is for them. Um, I think that like having a, a really solid look if it's actually true, you know, I mean, I've, I've begun to work with people now in their late thirties and forties around in there, because I was working with a lot of people in their fifties or even in their sixties, their kids were grown, you know, their kids were in their twenties, they had 20 year old, 30 year old children. And so 
I'd say maybe about seven or eight years ago, I began trying to work with people younger where their kids were young and they could begin to spend time with them and be the parents that they know, I know that they wanted to be. So a lot of it is like seeking to create some harmony in their lives. And um, I, I don't know what different people's beliefs are, um, but I think that uh, most studies show that uh, working anything more than 50 hours a week becomes very, very inefficient. Um, we accomplish about 10% uh, uh, of what we actually you know, do the rest of those hours. So if you work 60 hours, you're really only getting about an hour of work past that, of quality work. So, um, you know, which is enough time to still spend time with the people that you love, take care of your body. Uh, I'm a big proponent of seven and a half hours of sleep, at least 30 minutes of fitness a day, meditate every day. So what I try to do is I start weaving that in with people. And then I start seeing what compromises they've had to make and what fears come up from those compromises that that's really, I think, a voice and the voice when we begin to get to know it pretty well is really a shadow. You know, it's really the part of us that's kind of chiming in and saying, oh, they don't really love you or it's going to fall apart. You know, don't do that. Don't do that. It's going to fall apart. And, um, and sometimes the uh, relationships that we have, they do fall apart because people aren't necessarily with us because they love us. They're with us because they want that kind of adapted performing part of us that, um, that's, that's kind of common, you know? So I hope that answers your question. I mean, I could probably share more or some specific individuals that, um, that's common. I mean, people come to me because they're having a, an issue, you know, and the issue is, is, you know, begins to kind of have them put those things together. Any other questions or? I'm very interested with, with your idea about the the maps that we develop as a child. And then it's some, I'm, I'm wondering, is, is there some form of defense that occurs at a physical level or at a, a processing level, do you think that makes people live this um, false self or defensive self? Absolutely. You know, that's where, you know, our personality develops. That's where, you know, all those different things develop. And um, yeah, sure, they're all defenses. And um, I think that, you know, we could call it parts work, we could call it voice dialogue, we could call it, you know, all these different things that um, I don't know, you know, this being therapist hour, if it's, you know, that some of this stuff may fall into your expertise. But um, I think that, you know, a shadow, you know, comes from, uh, you know, say an inner child that, um, if the inner child is wounded because they're not getting their need met, they enlist the help of another entity, which then gets the need met. And that part also um, has other, brings other energies or emotions or things online. Uh, the discomfort is brought online by some particular entity that's helping to make sure I continue to, um, you know, do what I've been doing and don't do anything different because we're all convinced that this is the only way. So these are all, but yes, very much defenses and um, facades and adapted kind of parts that I think all relate back to, you know, this belief that then uh, enlists entities to um, get their needs met in spite of and, to, and at the same time to substantiate the belief. I'm sure I'm asking on behalf of 10 people, but how, um, because I certainly will react at a vibrational level if I meet somebody with my own similar shadow. I was wondering when you meet organizations or people similar to yourself with similar shadow or archetypal issues, how do you manage that yourself in the moment or do you have advice to us as therapists? Hmm. Well, <laughs> ideally, um, I don't necessarily identify with it. I recognize it and I see it. So at a vibrational level or, you know, or something at a, at a uh, consciousness stratus level, 
um, I can understand what's going on. And when you say archetype, yes, um, those of those different entities, which particular part. So I think that depending on what entity is um, being brought online to help get the need met, um, will have a particular energetic, you know, um, signature, so to speak. And um, what I usually do is I come into an organization or build a relationship with an individual, build that trust and build that rapport. And at a certain point, I feel like I have earned the right to confront or to call out. And then that's but what I'll basically do. I'll say, hey, so um, this part of you is running the show. It's come online and I'm picking it up. And um, I, I may even do, I'll use a lot of I statements and, you know, because I, all of this, I, I hope, and I think that we can identify with, like, I get why people are angry. You know, I'm really angry myself in certain circumstances. I get why people are sad. I get why people are grieving. I get why people get angry when they're grieving to protect themselves. And so, you know, that's where I'll begin to identify. So different as, as an individual, you know, I, I didn't choose to get um, licensed and, and certified and all that because, you know, I wanted to be able to kind of have come from a more peer-based and I know that as a therapist, there's a differential and I respect that, but that's where I use a lot of I statements. I'll say, hey, so, you know, this is what I usually do. Does that make sense to you? Do you identify with that? You know, try that on. What do you think there? And, um, and of course, I mean, there's people that then the walls go up and no, oh, no, 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 no. And say, well, it, yeah, I'm not attached, but, um, you know, maybe give that a thought and, and to consider that and, you know, when I talk to you next week, maybe, you know, think about, and I may give them an exercise or something like that, some type of a writing or, or meditation, something, and, um, and see what, um, you know, may come of it. And I don't know about you, but my engagements last, you know, anywhere from 18 months to 10 years. I mean, I've been working with some people and um, sometimes I plant a seed and, I, that doesn't sprout for a year or two or something like that. And um, so, so, yeah, I think that's how um, with, with that particular energy signature, then, then I, I, I would call it like a, it resonates with me or it lights up something in me. And um, yeah. Great. It sounds like you come with great, lovely curiosity and warmth. Um, and uh the questioning, uh, kind of almost a Socratic questioning side to you. Um, does anyone have any questions for chance about this, this his approach or um, with groups or individuals that, that makes you, uh, has made you think? I mean, I'm certainly curious about how you think of it in the context of a group or an organization as opposed to an individual. I'd, I'd be interested to hear more about that. So I've been working with an organization called the Mankind Project for you know, nearly 20 years. It's a worldwide, it's a men's organization, but I've had the, the, the pleasure of conducting probably a hundred or 125 of these different workshops. They're groups of usually about 30 to 40 to 60 staff, and then anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40 participants. And um, it is funny to work with a group to, to, have the energy of the group tend to kind of like morph and shape and shift and um and there's an arc you know there's an arc to these things and i think that the more uncomfortable uh people get the more they contribute an energy to the group which then in many ways can become contagious and then those adaptive behaviors come up so we see a particular group of people getting big and loud. We see a particular group of people getting reserved or, you know, or they just don't show up. You know, they just, um, people's needs to take care of themselves, you know, show up more and more and more. And um, so I, I think that depending, you know, in, in Jung's archetypes, um, you know, there were, I think about 12 or so, I, I tend to think there's more like about 30, 
or 40 or you know however many because each energy and each entity having a little bit different kind of a thing um but they all have a um kind of an over pronunciation and they have a deflated like an over inflated or an under inflated and so they're kind of a more passive way you know so if we take the archetype of the lover and the lover is in charge of relationships. The lover is also the person who becomes yearning and needy and addictive. And, um, or they become disconnected. And uh, so, which tended to be my experience as a kid is I was uh, neglected and um, ignored and, and so on and so forth. So, my uh, adapted behavior was i just don't have any needs and i'll just figure it out on my own and so in a group what i think we tend to see is that you know those people they become uh, up against the other ones they become more obvious you know we're like oh this is so and so doing that thing because this is the thing that they do when they you know are there so you know what would be called the wounded lover you know, there's the wounded lover or the addicted lover or something like that. Same thing, you know, like with the archetype of the warrior, the warrior being the person that like gets the job done, you know, the person who's in charge of uh, boundaries and commitments and things like that. And, um, you know, the, the warrior is that entity that um, everything looks like a nail because all they have is a hammer. So when people kind of get, you know, scared or when they tend to be uncomfortable and then they just kind of overinflate that warrior and then they just hammer, 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 hammer everywhere. And um, I think it just in groups, like I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking back of like, I've even been, so I've taught these workshops all over the world. Um, so South Africa, um, New Zealand, Australia, and different places all over the United States, but, <clears throat> You know, like there's individuals in Chicago, you know, like I've taught many workshops in Chicago and I, I like to be, um, um, you know, generalizing, you know, there's like, when we think of Chicago, we think of that type of person that like speaks a specific way, they behave, they carry their body a specific way. And so those people in that space, they all kind of just like group together and they get big, they get loud and they swear a lot. And they're not the type of people that tend to kind of go into a softer space where they would be, you know, like allowed to grieve and they would be allowed to touch that kind of wounded lover part of themselves. Whereas like in New Zealand, it's quite the opposite. People are softer, they're gentle, they're more adapted in a way that's like um, less harsh, less um, American, United States American, so to speak. And, um, you know, just kind of see that a lot, a more gentle, loving culture that um, has evolved in the way that, that has that uh, being pronounced. Can you tell us about how, <laughs> How, how do you manage people? How do you uh, maintain the alliance with your, your clients when, when they're self-sabotaging? How do you set the scene to address that, that they're self-sabotaging? You know, the thing, the first thing that comes to mind is that sometimes I will split them out sometimes I will and I will say, um, I, I think it's the CIA or some other, maybe it's any kind of um, military police, you know, so they're meant to protect the country from both foreign and domestic enemies. And we have domestic enemies. We, 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 you know, we hurt ourselves, we sabotage ourselves. And so sometimes I'll split them out and I'll say, hey, so I'm not really liking how you're treating, you know, yourself. And I'll say, well, I want you to kind of see from my point of view, what's going on here and what you're doing. And, um, and sometimes I'll just kind of confront sometimes a little bit hard, depends on my nature of my relationship with them. And, um, and I'll say, you know, you're really screwing this up, you know, like you're doing this over and over and over. I want to point this out and bring them data so that I can kind of like show them a series and a pattern of a behavior and, um, and then usually I'll say, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you want to do something about it? Um, what are your ideas about how to deal with this? Um, 
And like I said earlier, when I have said I'm, you know, I seek to earn the right to, to confront, you know, the further on, along into the relationship and the more intimate and the more trust I have, the more confrontational I'll be. And, you know, if I feel like I have a lot of trust, I too will take a risk to lean into discomfort, my own discomfort. Like, oh man, what are they, they going to be okay? Are they going to be pissed? Because they, sometimes they are. And, um, and to know, like, they need to hear, you know, I, a friend of mine, and I've adopted it, says, uh, you know, a good therapist or a good coach doesn't tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what you need to hear. It sounds like you're almost purposefully misattuning um, to the person that you suddenly go quiet and say, look, you're really going to jerk to yourself here. Um, how do you help people stay with that and their softer side? How do you help them be, develop self-compassion and love for themselves? I think it happens over time. It happens over repeated, you know, reminding and what I've been calling confrontation is, you know, it's just to confront them with this, with an alternate view, with an alternate reality. Um, because what we know is like what we are familiar with feels normal and familiar. And so beginning to, you know, it's like either initially confronting and then continuing to remind until it lands or until it kind of, you know, we get a foothold in there that we can um, step, off, you know, higher from, you know, climb the rung of, of that. So a lot of it's repetition and a lot of it is, um, and, uh, you know, frankly, I just take many approaches, even with the same individual. Sometimes I'll bring it a little softer. Sometimes I'll bring it more aligned. Sometimes I'll bring it, you know, something like holy, you know, like, you've got to pull it together yeah it's, it's lovely it's almost like goodwill hunting where he, he where he talks about his father giving the option between the the um spanner or the, the or the belt and he says i always chose the belt i always chose the spanner because i could choose and um, right. so that you're going to get these people from going from the hard side into that that softer side you're you're they must be frightened of that are they to, to go softer i think we all are i think you know i think that you know at any given moment, I mean, I think that sometimes I prefer like to be, you know, just hammered, but to have somebody come at me with a lot of love and a lot of compassion, I feel like think more seen. And I mean, I, you know, all of us are humans. So all of us have these, these um, things laying dormant or that have the opportunity to be brought up in us. And um, so, yeah. Great. Um, are there any other questions people have of a, a chance? And this is a fantastic uh, possibility to ask something that you, might be on your mind. Is Melissa, is there something in you have as a question? You're on mute, Melissa. Hi there. So I'm just curious about the sort of the boundary between your involvement with people and and what we do as psychotherapists. And I mean, what's the line for you where you feel like someone you work with would need to cross over and see, you know, see a licensed psychotherapist? Well, um, uh, I have some general kind of ideas. Uh -huh. And um, mind you that, you know, not all therapists or psychotherapists or counselors and um, are, are wired the same, but my idea is that a, uh, a person would go to therapy in order to get a lot of things off their chest. Uh, they, they talk a lot more than they are talked to. You know, there's less dialogue and more, you know. So what I say is um, a therapy is a place to go and to say things that are uncomfortable to say. And um, in my relationships, I come into those relationships where people hear a lot of things that are uncomfortable to hear. So a lot more feedback, a lot more, I, I would even say some of what I do is project. You know, I project and kind of lend my opinions on things depending on the situation or depending on the relationship. Um, you know, I may come in pretty heavy and, uh, and, and give my opinion, which is risky and, and reserved for the most part um but sometimes that'll happen I, I think too you know if someone is um 
unwilling to implement changes, unwilling to, you know, kind of, I mean, I think we've all had unworkable clients or patients where I don't know what to do, you know, and I'll say, Hey, I, I'm not sure um, how to serve you, but I think that so-and-so might be able to do that better. Um, there might be some things, you know, like I have a lot of knowledge over the last 20 years and I did take a lot of, you know, psychology stuff in college and I'm self-read and all that. Um, but there's things I don't know, you know, I don't know about. And so if something begins to seem like it's outside my wheelhouse, then I'll say, you know, I, I'm, this is outside my means or, you know, this is something. And I have different, you know, referral partners and, and you know, uh, strategic partnerships that I will uh, help to, you know, because I do a, a particular thing and I do that particular thing pretty well, but there's a lot of things I, I'm, I'm glad to admit I don't do well. I just wondered what the role of uh, medications can be also in terms of addressing self-sabotaging with clients and what may be getting in the way for them in terms of motivation or um, is it just something that is worked with in the process? Well, I, I don't have, I, since I don't do any clinical work, I don't, I, I mean, I have um, experience with medications. I have experience with self-medicating um, and so I, I don't know, I'll, I'll shoot from the hip here just a little bit and give you a, a relatively short answer, which is um, I believe that it's actually fairly rare that someone needs um, pharmaceutical intervention. Um, but in, in those cases, that's absolutely what they need. And, and I'm more than happy to admit when something seems like it's that's what's needed. And I, and I don't know, I can't, uh, can't give that expertise, but to say like, hey, why don't we do this in parallel? You know, when you see someone clinical psychiatrist or some other, you know, uh, doctor that can handle that. Um, but I think that um, there's a lot of stuff that can be managed in that kind of mi middle gray area of people that may experiment with some medications or temporarily do that, that can be managed through having a healthy, harmonious routine and lifestyle, exercising, meditating, sleeping eating well and, you know, like kind of being, having a healthy, you know, body and stuff like that. And um, so that's my, that's my attempt at, at, at answering that question. Do you have an example of when you maybe consulted with her or another psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist or a social worker or, uh, or counselor um, where um, you kind of work together with, with a client that's stuck or, or a group of people that are stuck? Sure. Um, well, some of the significant differences is that like, we come with a different energy, you know, and I come from a peer based mentor based, I come with like an open book and, um, I tell this to people most of the time at some point in my engagement with them, I'm an open book and you can ask me anything. Most of the things that I'm going to share with you about how to solve problems are because that's how I've solved my own problems. And, um, so I, I'm coming at a, like shoulder to shoulder rather than like, um, you know, a face to face or, you know, like, I'm going to tell you how to fix this problem. I'm not going to tell you, you know, that I've ever had that issue with that problem, which I think is really important. Some people want that. They want to have that dictated to them and they want to have more of a knowledge base. Um, you know, and, and for me, it's more of an experience based. And now, I mean, I, I've worked with. I, I don't know, but I can tell you more than a thousand people. So having a, a broad swath of, of that and being able to kind of have the demographics all being grouped together, no matter where you are on the spectrum or an outlier, understanding that. Um, so I think that that's in some ways the difference that's important to kind of do at the same time. Um, I don't do it as much anymore. I do still do do it from time to time, but um, you know, a therapist, my opinion, and I could be totally wrong because therapists are different, but you know, I see, I, they, they see a, a patient or client, you know, on Monday at five and then they see them next Monday at five or whatever. And sometimes I see a client every day, you know, or I check with them five minutes, 15 minutes every single day. Sometimes it's a couple times a day over the course of a period, you know, like 
you know, I had a client last summer, um, summer of, of this year, 2021, who, you know, was going through a relationship termination. And, you know, I think for probably three weeks or so, talk to him every day, you know, or I sent him stuff every day. And I don't know that that's a, a, an approach that a client would do, you know, where it's like, I think it's important that they have someone who's kind of a buddy, kind of a, you know, someone that they can like just chat and connect with while having some kind of a boundary, some kind of a, of a professional, you know, kind of disconnect. Um, I don't do any middle of the night calls anymore. I don't do that. Um, and I think that like with a therapist, it's even less, you know, it's like, um, and I know Kristen's work is very much emergency based. It is very much, you know, have a conversation with a client for three hours, maybe even do more things, which is, is abnormal. And, you know, uh, and I think that more therapists, you know, could do that. You know, I've, uh, one of my, I, I'm read Edith Eager's primary book, the choice, you know, and some of the things that she has done with clients where going for a walk or doing different things like that is just abnormal, you know, for um, a therapist. And I do, I mean, I go to museums with people, I go to their homes, I go to drive in their car. I mean, that's several things that I want to do is I want to hear them on the phone. I want to drive, see how they are in traffic. I want to go to museums with them. I want to take walks with them. And there's, so there's a lot of stuff like that. that's different. You know, they come to my home and, you know, I, We'll go and have a drink with them. I will go and do it differently. I want to see how they are in relationship to their, um, you know, their relationships, their partners, their different things like that. I'll go to their businesses, and see how they interact in their offices. So, you know, that's a thing that's very different. And where, you know, having that more defined container, that more, you know, the setting of, a, of an office, I think that that's important for, you know, it just brings different energies to the conversation and to the to the relationship that um, work well together. And Chance, you know, uh, how, how you're working is exactly how Bruce Perry works, who is, has now recently written a book with Oprah Winfrey. He's a child psychiatrist. And what he basically says is you figure out what works, particularly with traumatized people. And I know I came into contact right. with you during COVID when I started working with a lot of people with uh, early childhood trauma, military trauma, and basically had to figure out what's going to work as quickly as possible. And that's why uh, every day I'm working closely with coaches and sometimes I'm allowing their work to inform my work. We work with the particular people we work with because we identify with them or they're fascinating to us or there's some part of that individual or the group, the dem demographic of individuals that just we have some special interest in, who knows where it comes from. I think that if we look, we can figure out where and why that comes from it. Um, but I think that it's also very interesting to figure out the shoulder of that demographic and then the cross, you know, the, of that demographic to, um, you know, like I work with a lot of, you know, type A, I work with, I worked with pro athletes for a long time. I still do a little bit and I've worked with a lot of team guys, you know, that's where you and I have kind of come into relationship was, you know, working with SEAL Rangers, helping them qualify for selection and then also coming out of the military and, you know, what do they do? You know, how do they retrain those amazing skills of another really, really bright people, um, but not working in their relationships not working, you know, in, in, you know, different facets of their life. So, um, and I do that because I have a lot of that wiring in me, you know, of, uh, of type A, you know, performing, trying to be the best I can be, you know, a professional athlete kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's been a pleasure. I, um, thank you. I didn't, I had no idea what the setting of this was going to be or, or whatever. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> You know, I just rolled in and it's, it's great to see all your faces and yeah, thank you so yeah. much. And, and for um, the rest of you, thank you for coming this week and we'll see you next month. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.